citation is a way to indicate where you are in that conversation. So the citations give us that roadmap, roadmap back to work. In art, you don't necessarily cite a painting if you refer to a painting. Um, they will only provide a citation if it's a direct quote. The readers to know where the initial beginnings of that thought process, of that logical thinking even started. Why is citation important in research writing? It's not just about giving credit where it's due. Professor Michael Sell, Dr. Amy Yielding, Dr. Rebecca Hartman, Dr. Rhonda Fritz, and Dr. Chad Mueller met to talk about the importance of citation in undergraduate research and writing. What do the words scholarship as a conversation have to do with citation? First, it's important to know that in this context, scholarship refers to the research and writing you do for a specific class or for a program or major requirement. And citation, citing a source, means that you show within your writing that you took words, ideas, or images from another place. So, let's listen in. So I think a lot of students come to university and they don't understand the importance of citation in the same way that their professors do. So there's a gap of understanding. And for the social sciences, scholarship is like a conversation. Um, it doesn't matter what you write your paper on, the American Revolution, World War II, you're entering a conversation that people have already started. And so in a way, um, citation is a way to indicate where you are in that conversation. And it's a way to mark the difference between your ideas and ideas in the scholarship that you're building upon. So it's really important to make sure that you give credit to people's ideas um, that you've read and that you're using to build your own knowledge on. So in that sense, I think it doesn't matter if it's math or art or history, of the sciences, scholarship in higher education is a conversation that's been going on uh, for for years and years. I definitely feel like in education, it's, it's very important that our students understand where they get the ideas from. Sometimes they think, well, that's the way I was taught, so that's the way um, I will I will teach rather than drawing upon the theories that were behind what those practices that you see in schools. So it's very important for them to provide that evidence and understand where that comes from. When we're dealing with with biological systems, we're dealing with with factors that have been investigated through a wide variety of ranges, and to be able to utilize those variables in order to make our calculations go forward, we need to know where those come from. So the citations give us that roadmap, roadmap back to where those, those individual pieces started. We often think citation is just about giving credit. It's actually more about tracking history or recognizing where an idea came from originally. So in mathematics, we rarely have I think what you would call as a conversation, it's more of a, this is what was discovered and found, and citations are important to the readers to know where the initial beginnings of that thought process, of that logical thinking even started. So even as a mathematician today, I'll pick up a paper, and I may not know where all of the information they're using is coming from. And to that, citation is really important. I can go to the references and then follow the kind of breadcrumbs all the way back to the very start when someone first started thinking about, you know, abelian groups or something like that. Um, we don't put all of the information that you need to understand every bit of the logical statements in a mathematical paper. Um, they would be thousands of pages long. And so for us, it's not about necessarily backing up the argument that you're presenting in your paper, but giving almost like a history behind where it even began. But in, but in my discipline, students are continually drawing upon the past and giving credit to those sources is primarily more acknowledging their source of inspiration, where their ideas come from, because you can't, in art, you don't necessarily cite 
a painting if you refer to a painting, an Andy Warhol or a Monet or something, because maybe sort of, maybe it's similar to math in that there's this widely accepted, well, if they talk about Monet's water lilies, that's a painting that we can see. It's not a specific reference to something that they're, that they're pulling from. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so that conversation that Rebecca talked about earlier is, is less at the forefront because of students' personal involvement with the art that they're making. Uh, And on the art history side, there's that kind of more traditionally scholarly application of where students are getting their information and what other critics and scholars have written about. And then that conversation becomes a little more fluid. So what I hear when I listen to all of you talk about um, our different disciplines is that uh, regardless of whether it's a conversation in the social sciences or it's this idea of tracing back to the origin or really sort of a, a hybrid in a way in your field, is that it really is citation, regardless of how it's used in the field, is about scholarship being evidence-based. And so regardless of how you use the evidence, you use the evidence differently in math than I might in history, all the scholarship, all the work that you do as a, as a professor or as a student is based in evidence. And citation is the way that you sort of anchor your own work in evidence, in scholarship that's come before you, right? And that's, I think, the commonality that all the disciplines have. Citation can seem tricky, and when beginning to learn how to include citations in your writing, it may take practice to properly cite the sources you use. I think that students, especially early on, are intimidated by that differentiation between what their own thoughts and opinions and ideas might be versus what has come before them because there's legitimacy to published papers and books or even people with degrees higher than theirs that they present research more as here's what this person said, here's what this person said, here's what this person said. In summary, these people said this and they're leaving their own thoughts out of it. Um, And that's a problem because they should acknowledge even early on as freshmen or first or second year students that that conversation sort of revolves around where they are and what they're trying to discover right now. I think one thing that I've noticed students doing is um, they will only provide a citation if it's a direct quote. They don't realize that the idea itself, mm-hmm. if it belongs to someone else, you still need to cite that source, even if it's in your own words or um, something that you think you've changed, it still needs to have that citation if it's someone else's idea. In terms of how you use citation, I, I mean, I think one point we might miss is that students will make mistakes. I mean, part of the process is learning how to do citation. When I first started college, I was so terrified of not citing everything because then I would be plagiarizing that I totally oversighted because the common rule they tell you is like, well, if it's common knowledge, you don't need to cite. Well, you know, when I was 20, I didn't have a lot of, I didn't know what was common knowledge. (laughs) I thought everything was new. Well, the idea of common knowledge is uh, a lot, I guess, in uh, mathematics. And so um, what we usually have our students do um, to discern if something's quote common knowledge or not in mathematics is can you find it in a textbook? And so very often in lower level classes, if we have them write a report or a paper, um, they need to cite what textbook would another student need to have to be able to get the definitions. Definitions is classic example mathematics where, I mean, what is a, you know, what does it mean to add two numbers has been well established for a very long time. So you don't need to cite definitions, you know. So what you do instead is you provide me references. What textbooks would I need to get the basics to where I could understand it? And then you work your way up to what papers, you know, um, what mathematicians and what works do those mathematicians have, the pieces that are more specialized. Um. And oftentimes students are uh, afraid maybe to put their own ideas out there because it's risky. Um, you sort of feel like you're 
Well, I don't know exactly. You're a sort of asserting knowledge that you may not feel confident that you have, but it's better to take that risk, right, than to, you don't want to spend four years just regurgitating what other people have said. And, it, and to the idea of um, including your own knowledge is really important. Why would I read your paper if you're not saying anything? Um, as mathematicians, we're very uh, easily distracted and bored. So if you're not going to say it quickly and without a bunch of you know nonsense, um, I wouldn't want to read it. And so you want to state what others have done, and then you better contribute to the knowledge next. It's all about adding to the discipline and then disseminating that knowledge effectively and efficiently. And in some, scho- in some scholarly writing, ideas, specific ideas or theses or whatever is, are hard to pin down for students if they're reading mm-hmm. longer papers or whole books. And so they aren't, they aren't fully aware of when they make an assertive point of an idea that's based on something they read, they're not citing back to that. They're more likely to, when was this person born? Who was their mother? Where did they live? Where did they go to school? This kind of factual, empirical information about people that they're writing about, that that is the basis for citation. Well, I didn't know when Vincent van Gogh was born. I went and found out, and now I can link that to this source. But when someone, if they're jumping on someone else's idea about a specific mm-hmm. artist, they don't understand that, well, if they wrote that, then you need to cite that as well. So sometimes you'll err on the side of oversighting. Um, sometimes it's more dangerous to err on not citing enough, but it is a learning process. I, for me, anyway, in history, what's important to us is, is not that students um, get it right from the get-go, is that students understand that they have to begin learning. Like, you have to engage in citation, no matter what kind of paper you're using. Um, and that way you can fix your mistakes and move on. And you'll learn over time, over that first year or second year, how to distinguish more clearly an idea that you've had from an idea that you read about or learned from a source. It takes time. The one thing I would add that I see a lot, and I think we're all guilty of it, because I think it's human nature, is we interject our own bias into the citations that we select. Um, mm-hmm. especially in the fields in, in that, that I deal with. Um, there's a lot of confirmation bias in the type of citations that are used. It doesn't mean citations are good or bad. I mean, it's, it's how they're plucked type of deal. And, and I think we're, that's just human nature, that we all have our own biases from our own experiences, and we have a tendency to select some of those. So my comment to students, undergrad, is first understand that you have a bias. There's nothing wrong with that. But to also keep that in mind when you're diving through the literature and you're selecting those references to, to support that information, that um, if you recognize you have a bias, you're willing to open up that door to other citations and other views that's coming in. And it makes it a, a better paper, a better overall project in the end. APA, MLA, Chicago, Caribbean? There is no one standard citation style required at EOU, so how do you know which style to use? Like it or not, you've got to use the style required by the individual instructor or used in a particular publication. Art and art history typically use a style known as Chicago style, which is footnote-based. Uh, where there are, in the text, there will be little numbers that then guide you down to the bottom of the page or the very end of whatever you're reading? Uh, in mathematics, it completely varies from journal to journal. Um, and um, many an uh, English professor does not believe us, and a double check, and yes, there is no common style. So what, what is very common is um, I have an idea of what maybe three journals that would be appropriate for the paper I go to that journal's website, and they tell me what style they want it in. And most of them nowadays give you even a template. So most recently, I submitted to the Electronic Journal of Linear Algebra, and they actually had a template that I put my paper into. It was very convenient. Um, But I did have to modify how I had my references. But it was a quick and easy modification. If you cite appropriately to begin with, it's easy to modify to whatever style the uh, 
paper wise. Well, before I go to history, I want to follow up on what you said, because I thought your point about submitting to different journals was really important. Um, you submit to a different journal, and you submit with your reference style done in the way the journal requires. Yeah. Um, it's sort of the same thing for students. So if you are taking uh, an English class and you are required to cite using MLA, then you cite using MLA. And then if you come and take a history class for me, you use Chicago. And it doesn't matter that MLA is what you know. You also have to know Chicago for my class or your class or APA for anthropology. So I think for students and professors, that's a commonality. We, we have to do the citation based on who we're sending the paper to. History uses Chicago as well. The undergraduate version of Chicago is called Turadian. So sometimes we'll say Turadian and sometimes we'll say Chicago. It's it's basically the same thing. There's some minor variations in the template that you use. So for education, we use the APA, um, American Psychological Association. So with that one, there are in-text citations, parentheses. Um, you put the author's uh, last name and the date there and then the reference list at the end is just in alphabetical order. So there really isn't the mechanism for any kind of footnote or any um, expansion of the idea. It just tells you where it's from and that's very standard in education and every journal I've ever looked at from the name too. So we, it's again, dependent on, on journal. Um, for us, so if we look at Journal of Animal Science, Journal of Dairy Science, Journal of, of Agronomy, every one of those actually publish their own style and format mm -hmm. on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you go into those, you have to follow that profile. Yeah. But I think the important thing is, is that if you, if you are confident with any of the styles, if you're like, I am this style, right? That's good. Write it that way to begin with, and then go look at what is required of you and adjust it. If you, if you know at least one style well, you can adjust it. But it's really just taking the information that you have from your source and then plugging it into a template uh, that is going to vary depending upon the discipline. So to me, it's not even about learning a system. It's just about following the rules for your citation before you submit your paper. Including citations in your research writing is important, not only to show your readers that you've done the proper research and to give credit to other researchers, but to refer to the evidence that has helped you to join the conversation around a research topic or issue. Citations make your research more credible and more legitimate. You're legitimizing your own thoughts based on the research of others, and so it's a way to make your paper to make your writing better, not just to make your paper longer. Oh, and I think also adding to that idea of um, legitimacy and making sure that they are showing and demonstrating that they um, are staying current with ideas as well. But it also adds a level of accountability that they're presenting their, hopefully they're presenting their ideas and they're using this information and by, by including those citations, they're also being accountable for what their, their interpretation, the information that they're conveying. Because people are reading your paper to learn, and um, you can't include everything they need to know in the paper. And citations are there for the curious and excited reader to go learn more. Here are some things to remember about why and how we cite. Using citations is how you show you've engaged with the ideas of scholars that came before you. Citations provide evidence to support your own ideas and conclusions. You should cite any time you refer to thoughts or ideas that are not your own. This includes quoting and paraphrasing in your own words. And you cite in the body of your paper as well as in the bibliography. Become comfortable with varying styles. They are just templates that you can plug into, and they vary from subject to subject for good reasons. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
paying attention. <laughs> I feel like I have to speak to really quick. <laughs> well, I think he's already recorded. <laughs> <laughs> our citation video will be five minutes and our blooper. Wait, what's citation? 